I would like to welcome the guests, the public, veterans, to the San Francisco Veterans Building for the first lecture of our new Veterans Lecture Program. The purpose of our program is to provide a forum for veterans who have special knowledge or experience to share with the public. Tonight, our first veteran speaker is retired Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Roger S. Dong. English. 
So maybe you should click on that. <laughs> and if you do, you get a wonderful, up-to-date website from Chinese sources that covers everything that's going on. Because only China is a familiar. This project is so huge, nobody knows what's going on except perhaps a few people in, Chinese, in the Chinese government. Because we're talking about projects in Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Indonesia, Australia, and the whole Eastern Hemisphere. Now, some of you may not, those of you who are aware, should be aware that today, seven of the ten richest countries in the world are in the Eastern Hemisphere based on cash flow. Cash flow. Number one, China. Number two, Japan. Number three, South Korea. Number four or five, between four and five was Taiwan and Singapore. Throw in Russia and Saudi Arabia, you have the seven richest company, countries in the world. Now, can you imagine if this project connects the entire Eastern Hemisphere, how that would happen to the economies of the world? And that's something why I'm in a mission to talk to us about it, because our media has not covered this. I've talked to PhDs at Berkeley given this lecture, and a lot of them have never heard of the whole project. And so we are totally ignorant, not necessarily your fault, but um, it's our mission here with the help of our distinguished speakers to explain this project to you. This will be factual based. We will not exaggerate. Um, with my family here, I hear that lie. <laughs> so uh, we'll have questions and answers later. I didn't make my notes tonight, so we'll be guided by what shows up here. The last time I tried to give the presentation, it was in total darkness. And so I learned that don't rely on notes. Hopefully your PowerPoint is working. Oh, Silk Road. We did one back slide. We see one before. We're going to have a lot of pictures of the new Silk Road to the United States. One of them, just as a starter, a very simple one. The uh, the red, the, co the color lines up top are uh, the are the infrastructures going. Only a few. It's a, it's a pictorial graphic of what's happening on, on the land, which is with a lot of railroads and new roads. Then in the south, the blue line, blue line is the Maritime Silk Road, which is not as important as high-speed rail, but very critical because it's how they link Africa, Australia, and southern parts of, it, of, of uh, Eastern Hemisphere to ports throughout, the, uh, throughout the, the middle of the map there where they can offload their, their goodies and put them on high-speed rails. Now, this is not happening tomorrow. This will probably take a decade or two. But tonight you saw a visual of a real thing that's already happening today. Gives you an idea of what the potential is. The uh, system originally, the plan originally was called the Silk Road Economic Plan about five, six years ago. Then it was converted, it was renamed the One Belt, One Road, or Over. Those of us familiar with the project always refer to it as Over. So if you hear Over, it's not some in the future we're talking about the One Belt, One Road project. And then most recently, in the last year, it's been called the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. It's the same project. We showed you a few pictures. There are thousands, little hundreds of pictures of the, the project, and we'll show you a few quickly and show you, give you an idea of what they all look like. This is the simplest one. The red, the red line, of course, is the main silk road project. There's one that illustrates the very important silk maritime road. Uh, you can see that on the east, on the eastern border corner of China, the number of ports are start ports for the uh, beginning points for that. It's no good. It's too bright. My pointer doesn't work. But as you can see, the blue line is, is the sea routes, and they most recently opened in Djibouti. According to the grant plan, there are, there are specific plans to build up corridors where they can focus businesses. And as you can see here, there are, there are quite a few corridors. One of the most important corridors that's very well established, I want to point out to you, is the, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That's been going on for over 10 years. 
and the Chinese have put started a budget that started for 46 billion and is now put to 75 billion. And the GDP of this small little country has gone from less than a billion to five billion in about five years. It shows you what excellent logistics does for you. The main thing that's, that's never mentioned, in fact, the reason Pakistan has done so well is that suddenly the whole country is electrified. They have the largest wind farms and solar farms there. Most people don't realize that two of the three nuclear power plants were built by the Chinese there a few years ago. Uh, they're building the third one in, uh, on the right hand side there. But uh, as an example of what can happen when you have good funding and good infrastructure, because Pakistan a few years ago was kind of considered one of the lowest and most depressed countries in the world with GDP of less than a billion dollars. <laughs> One more map before we move on. This is a German map, and I like it because it's total. It shows you the corridors, it shows you the sea routes, and all the ports. Thanks to our friends in Germany who are watching this project. Notice the, all the contacts into Africa. We'll come back over there. What are people thinking about over in BRI? Well, you have two schools of people. Those who don't believe, the deniers who <laughs> think this is fake news. <laughs> then those are the some those are xenophobic. Those who are so scared of China growing up so fast, and for good reason, we have not seen a country grow up so fast, so powerfully, and uh, even I might need shape once in a while when I think about all the changes that are going on in China. And then there are people who aren't quite so uh, Narrow-minded. Let's talk about. It. Let's see what they are thinking. This guy is a quotation from Ambassador Charles Freeman. You remember his name? He was the interpreter for Kissinger and then Nixon, and then he became ambassador to Saudi Arabia, to uh, Switzerland, and finally Saudi Arabia. He says one belt one road is a transform transformational concept that deserves to be treated with utmost seriousness. China's Belt and Road Initiative promises to integrate the economies of the vastly larger Eurasian landmass, and it will do so not just with railways, waterways, pipelines, fiber optic cables, power transmission lines, but ports, airports, and industrial estates. If any significant part of this comes off, it will position China as a preeminently accessible society on a supercontinent with far the greatest weight in world affairs. What else do our people saying or looking at this positively? Professor Sachs at Columbia University says this biggest world geopolitical, geopolitical trend today is not America first, or the global war on terror, or Brexit, or the renewed Cold War with Russia. It is the economic integration of Europe and Asia, especially the European Union with China, Europe, and Asia, cohabit the world's largest land mass Eurasia. He didn't mention Africa. Africa is right to this too, and Australia. China has recently proposed an important initiative that calls the Belt and Road, One Belt One Road, to build transport communications and energy infra infrastructure to connect the various regions of Asia of Asia and Asia with Europe. Professor Sachs. From Fortune, it's a one belt, one belt, one road, China's three trillion infrastructure building project. That's a low number, it's about six trillion now. Could be it wouldn't fall for some Western companies and investors. Can you imagine if you look back at the last map showing the whole East Tech, the amount, the amount of work and contractors can go on covering the entire Eastern Hemisphere. If nothing else, businesses should be should be gasping at opportunity. Now, look at the mix up. The Belt and Road is a very, very big deal for GE. Rachel Duan, president of CEO of GE Greater China, tells Fortune, her $8 billion division of 23,000 employees, main business is partnering with Chinese companies across 34 joint ventures in China that manufactures everything from wind turbines to oil pipeline. Duan sees GE as a company to help them. It already has operators to go in 60 of the 65 countries associated with the project. So you can imagine if GE is there, and lots of other countries should, countries should be there too, because this is a big project. Nothing ever bigger as big as this. We mentioned Honeywell. There is Honeywell again. I 
think I only here's the last portion talks about bros. We saw that in the video. Normally the video is shown after this, but you you are seeing what we're talking about here. Bros is a huge operation in Jungshin. And they used the Japanese model, by the way. The Japanese model is one that they invented, which is really cool. You set up a major operation like the bros, and you move or invite all your suppliers to be your neighbors. So the inventory is not a problem. You have online inventory so that all your supporting agencies know exactly what you need. They'll always have ready for you. They won't make too much. They won't make too many. You as manufacturer will always have parts on time. All manufacturers are like that. But using the Japanese model, the Chinese have studied the world very closely. And the Japanese model is it works very quickly. One more positive statement from the China scholar Peter Potelier of John Hopkins School. The Oprah project has not been gotten the degree of attention it deserves. I'm concerned that its significance is underrated in the US and the West in general. Hopefully tonight we'll get everybody more informed. To give you a little bit of background, this just happened overnight. Even though Xi Jinping thought of the idea a few years ago, the reason all this happened was there's a lot of things that happened before that. First of all was the role of traffic in the Indian Ocean. And the second thing is the role of Chinese President Xi Jinping. What's happened in the last 30 years is there's tremendous transformation in the Indian Ocean. One, because of Chinese African investments in, in, in trade, 50 of the 54 countries that in, in Africa now have been trading with China very, very successfully. Today, three of the fastest growing GDP in the world are African countries. Starting with small base, but they are mainly, in my opinion, due to the huge investment the Chinese have made there in building infrastructure, trains, power plants, everything. And also, of course, there's a lot of investment in trade in Southeast Asia as well as Australia. As you, some of you may not know, whenever I talk to Australians about China, they smile from year to year because for the last 30 years, the only country that has not had any problems with the economy are Australians. They trade about 43 minerals with China, so every year it's smiles, smiles, dollars, dollars. And of course, there's been a tremendous increase of hydrocarbon transport and trade in, in the Middle East. Here's a map that shows you a lot of things that's going on. Chinese investment in Africa is very big, but I'll show that a little later. Percentage of oil keeps on going up. Uh, uh, there's the Malacca Strait. It's one of the reasons why Chinese are very Chinese and Americans are paranoid is the dilemma of the Malacca Straits. Strange. We both worry about the same thing. We're both worried about something blocking the Malacca Straits. In fact, not a single commercial ship in the last 20 years has been interrupted in the Malacca Straits. Because who's going to mess with trade? Here's a map of uh, Africa. You can, I know it's too, hard, it's too uh, small for you to print, but you can see where all the action is in China. Uh, the one thing that the Chinese did that we, our Western components, did not do. When our Western companies went to Africa, we had a win-win situation. The, the contractor makes money, and the rulers and the government make money. But very seldom did anything you know, drift. drift down to the city, to the people or the countries. When China went here, they used a win-win-win proposition. You have the contractor makes money, a few rulers get their pockets and wallets lined up, but then they always leave something for the people. It could be a power plant, it may be a railroad, it may be any number of things. But that's something that uh, we learned very slowly, is that we just can't go in there and leave nothing for the people. And so, not in every case, but almost all cases, Relationship between African states and China is very, very tight. Can't see that map well. I just we all, it just shows you how uh, the trade routes that the uh, oil gets more and more important for everybody. And a reminder that today, at least five trillion dollars worth of trade is carried by sea through the Indian Ocean and through the Malacca Straits.
Let's talk about Xi Jinping in the, in the Belt and Road Initiative and the China Green. The reason, in my opinion, this is opinion, not necessarily fact, that uh, President Xi has uh, promoted this project is that he has a huge problem on his hands. As most of you know, for 30 years, China grew at a rate of 10% a year. In the last couple years, it's been dropping 9, 8, 7, 6.5, 6.9. Economy this big, there's, there aren't little, little things that you can do to boost things back up again. So you've got to think big. And in my opinion, this project is thinking big. Because only when you engage with the entire Asian hemisphere and you have any chance of kicking your GDP down, size of the country, size of China, up to 8% or 9% again. And with all this trade, that's a possibility. Right? Maintaining both your economy and an alternative to Malacca Straits. 98% of everything, a few years ago, it's maybe changed now with the higher speed rail. 98% of everything produced entering or, or leaving China went by sea. A lot of stuff even to southern China went by sea because it's cheaper that way. And so therefore, Chinese are extremely sensitive to the sea trade. And therefore, they've got to do something to provide an alternative answer to ships. Now, you can't do anything without money. And so let's talk about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. That, that was an idea that's only about two and a half or three years old. Introduced by Xi Jinping. And uh, then, only 18 months ago, it opened its doors. 18 months ago, it has now funded over a trillion dollars worth of projects. Incredible. Compared to World Bank, IMF, Asian, these traditional funding agencies take three to five years from incubation to funding. In a year and a half, Chinese study banks when they overcome the shortcomings of those other banks that they have. Last week, Fitch gave it a three, three star rating. A month before, Moody's gave it a three star rating. It only goes to banks that are extremely strong and stable. They also looked at the trade that's gone on in the last year with the AIB, and they thought it was a really good deal. I was surprised. We look back history, China has conceptualized AIB in 2013 and formally opened, opened its banks in 17 January 2016 with 57 nations. There are now 80 nations, which have increased to, it's a 70, that's an old slide, it's 80 now. Entry fee is about $2 million for a lot of the smaller countries. The application fee in the beginning is costing another $2 million. But the bigger countries pay a little bit more money. India paid $9 billion. And what happens is everybody who's a member gets to vote. But it's not stacked up like the IMF or the World Bank. China only has about 21%. India is 9%. The Russians have 7%. And everybody else in there has, has votes. As you can imagine, with so many projects that were approved last year, there's not a lot of no votes. So things get done. There isn't one party versus another party arguing about things. They just get things done. And that's a lesson for the rest of us. A look at the, the, the countries that are linked together in the New Silk Road. And this, of course, does not show South America, Australia, or Canada. They joined recently. Now, AIB, while it manages all this, is actually not the only bank, and it's not even the biggest bank. Uh, there's the China Development Bank, has almost a trillion dollars in there. It, the CDB doesn't do just, has been funding projects all over the world. That's why it's called China Development Bank. But now, the priority is this new silk route. And so most of the funding now this huge bank is the China CDB. Other banks, China's XM Bank, the Maritime Silk Bank, are part or already part of the IMF, World Bank, and ADB. Most people don't realize that. You don't care about that. We thought that they were, they were competing. There's not a competition. The, the motive and intent of the Chinese, of Xi Jinping, of China, is to work together and cooperate. Kind of a novel idea. So they have welcomed the United States 
to be part of the project, and it wasn't until last month that we decided, yes, okay. And you want to find out or get uh, find out more about AIT, HTTPS AIT.org, and that's also a section that gets come totally in Chinese and look at the English button. This is a little old, but it's still worth talking about the status of this. In 2016, 900 projects were under contract or completed and negotiated with a value of 900 billion. I guess in June, it's reported they're up to 100, uh, about 1,000 projects now and 1.27 trillion dollars have been paid for projects. Kind of shakes you up. With all that's being done, the world's gonna change. It's almost to be predicted that the world will change. Already, we, we saw one, one uh, the video was a train from Jongqing to Duisburg. Well, we've got a train that's gone to Madrid and one that's gone to London. Now, these are all trial. These other ones are trial. The Jongqing train, train is going five times a week and they're doing great both ways. The other tracks are in development. They have, the train has gone, but it's, they're just breaking it in. It's going to be years, a few more years before Madrid and London and all these other countries are very, they haven't built the high speed rail, uh, railroads yet. But to everybody's surprise, even though this is an economic project and not a geopolitical project, the old world is now considered a global economic development plan as well. There are also cultural and scientific goals that you won't hear about. The general, the director general of UNESCO, Irina Boko, says the DRI is fascinating potential for developing education, intercultural cult, dialogues, and social inclusion, and equity in social society as well. Now, the head of the science magazine, Dennis Norville, said she committed committed to support science and engineering, includes new laboratories, and cooperation in AI, nanotechnology, quantum computing, and smart cities. He is, uh, the president of China is committed to training 5,000 foreign students in China, engineers, managers, and welcoming young scientists to, to China for the next five years. The other thing you don't care about too is the many, many foreign students from Africa, Central Asia, who are studying getting free education, getting degrees in China. And they, these, these are the best and brightest of these countries, and they're, they're learning Chinese, Chinese culture, as well as mathematics. So they're going to have great impact on their own countries when they go back. You don't read about that, but that's an important factor. They're also committed for 50 joint laboratories, the creation of big data, computing, environmental protection, and climate change planning. Now that we've sort of backed up in climate change, the Chinese now are taking the lead in climate change projects. For shame. For us. That's good the Chinese are doing it. But for us, it's good. For us. Longer concept, you've seen, I think you saw, you've seen this already. This is the, the Schiller Institute, the co-sponsor for this organization, dreamed this up 30 years ago, except they didn't have a trillion dollars to fund this thing. So it's been in the back burner. But, uh, I welcome them to co-sponsor for us because they are the, they are the pioneers for global, what do you call it, land, land transit? World land bridge, thank you. <laughs> okay, one thing that uh, was briefly mentioned in the film is that there is a possibility that uh, we could have high-speed rail from China to the United States. Yeah. It's very doable. China has special machines that dig big holes in the ground. <laughs> I've heard that maybe our own government some people are kind of nervous about that because they're afraid that if you could have high speed rails, everybody in China, particularly the military, might come over here. The train runs both ways, so the Chinese are worried about us saying that we're going to go there that way too. So I think some of those fears are paranoid, but this will take a long time, but it would be very great if it happens. <laughs> what will the future Super Bowls look like? I think we won't have any more of this. These are real train stations in China today. 
more likely like this. Maybe in LA we'll have something like this in about two years. There's your high-speed terminals. And to show you how things are already international, this is the front end of the high-speed rail train with the engineer there. And the entire front end cockpit electronics built by the Canadian Bombardier Corporation. So this to prove that you know the Chinese are serious about being international and trying to partner with everybody. Uh, they can build these things too, but they, it's wiser to why reinvent the wheel, right? So uh, recap again, what is really happening? Much progress in the first year, but this, this project is only a year and a half old. A year and a half old. We are still talking about the bridge over here after three years. And the unique thing is the first time in man's history that a major leading nation was bringing technology, money, and unique labor for everybody's benefit. Having said that, it should be obvious to everybody, including myself when I heard first of all, you've got to be skeptical that such a huge project can work when you have all these different people all the different politics, the different religions, the different everything is to cooperate. The main driver though is money. And most of the countries that are involved in this thing could never do this on their own. At first, there was a lot of skepticism. The first year of this mentioned only a few people raised their hands and I was Now, everybody's in it. Everybody's in it. Let's recap what happened this year, get back to nowadays. In January of this year at the Royal Economics Forum in Davos, Switzerland, President Xi Jinping defended globalization and pronounced that China is committed to growing an open economy and plead for cooperation in turbulent times. The intention of the Belt and Road Initiative, in addition to boosting global trade, is to promote cooperation, peace, win-win, win benefits, inclusion, no violence, fairness, social, economic justice, and equal partnerships. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people said that we wished our own president said that. <laughs> Xi Jinping also stated that this BRR project promotes respect for national sovereignty and non-interference of internal affairs of each country. So, just last month that the uh, International Cooperation Forum in Beijing, Xi Jinping said that China was adding another $4.5 billion for the Silver World Fund. So, more good news for everybody. Despite all the things we talked about, the BRR project is actually still work in progress, beginning work in progress, with no more than 1 to 2% of the work to be done. So that's a, that's a great inspiration for businesses who want opportunities because almost every country in the Eastern Hemisphere will need construction and all kinds of services. And despite the problem that China will benefit more than anybody else if this succeeds, the fact of good news is that all participants may benefit and prosper when this project succeeds. Even if it's partially succeeds, there's, a, there's probably a pretty good chance that 100% of this will never get done. But if, if instead of three high-speed railroads, we had two or even one that would change the economies of all the countries that are connected. High -speed, we've never seen high-speed rail before. Our own transcontinental railroad, which was not high-speed rail, changed our GDP immensely. And if it weren't for the transcontinental railroad, America would not have been a great country for our two current presidents to try to retrieve. High speed rail logistics is so important. Okay, move on. And then suddenly, we did a, until recently, we were, there were only, I think, uh, eight countries who were part of the AIB. May 14th, 27th, the day before the International Conference in Beijing. Uh, Chinese foreign minister in Washington begged 
the United States Professor, and I'm not sure who he went to, but we decided that uh, Matthew Pottinger, who was National Security Council Senior Advisor to the President, did attend and said some good things. He talked about the fact that uh, after a long and he's trying to invite us into it, and successful. Then a few days later, the only other holdout, Prime Minister, not President, a big Prime Minister now, that states that Japan will cooperate with the Belt and Road. That only left us. And a few days later, President Trump says, this is a good deal, we will cooperate. We will have to see these two world leaders actually get into action. And when that happens, I think that the acceleration of the success of this project will go off, will ramp up quickly because Japan and the United States holding up, not joining it is a big restriction on progress. And so things are looking good. <coughs> what is the future role for BRI? I'm asking you that. Cool, get you thinking about This is a big project. It's a project that is inclusive. It's going to do, people who need money will get money. Uh, we're going to have a briefing later on. The money issue is a big issue. A lot of people don't understand it. But our, our speaker, Mr. Steger, is going to tell you how the, how the money works. Because I think it comes up. If the interest rates are too high, people will get burned. If they're too low, it doesn't work either. So we'll go with Mr. Steger. But anyway, the future for Oberg, I think, is very, very positive. And I think. Uh, President Xi Jinping deserves a hand for promoting cooperation. It's a word that's not a vocabulary, but we haven't used it much. And win win for everybody. And so, uh, with that, I'd say thank you and uh, we'll have to